Tertullian, Apology, Chapter 1. Rulers of the Roman Empire, if seated for the administration of justice on your law tribunal, under the gaze of every eye, and occupying there all but the highest position in the state, you may not openly inquire into and sift before the world the real truth in regard to the charges made against the Christians. If in this case alone you are afraid or ashamed to exercise your authority in making public inquiry with the carefulness which becomes just. If, finally, the extreme severities inflicted on our people in private judgment stand in the way of our being permitted to defend ourselves before you, you cannot surely forbid the truth to reach your ear by the secret pathway of a noiseless book. She has no appeals to make to you in regard to her condition, for that does not excite her wonder. She knows that she is but a sojourner on the earth, and that among strangers she naturally finds both, and more than this, that her origin, her dwelling, Place. Her hope, her recompense, her honors are above. One thing, meanwhile, she anxiously desires of earthly rulers, not to be condemned unknown. What harm can it do to the law, supreme in their domain, to give her a hearing? Nay, for that part of it, will not their absolute supremacy be more conspicuous in their condemning her, even after she has made her plea? But if, unheard, sentences pronounced against her, besides the odium of an unjust deed, you will incur the merited suspicion of doing it with some idea that it is unjust, and not wishing to hear what you may not be able to hear and them. We lay this before you as first ground on which we urge that your hatred to the name of Christian is unjust, and the very reason which seems to excuse this injustice, I mean ignorance, at once aggravate and convicts it. For what is there more unfair than to hate a thing of which you know nothing, even though it deserved to be hate? Hatred is only merited when it is known to be merit, but without that knowledge, Whence is it just to be vindicated? For that is to be proved, not from the mere fact that an aversion exists, but from acquaintance with the subject. When men, then, give way to a dislike simply because they are entirely ignorant of the nature of the thing disliked, why may it not be precisely the very sort of thing they should not? So we maintain that they are both ignorant while they hate us, and hate us unrighteously while they continue in ignorance, the one thing being the result of the other either way. The proof of their ignorance at once condemning and excusing their injustice is that, that those who once hated Christianity because they knew nothing about it, no sooner come to know it than they all lay down at once their enemies. From being its haters they become its disciples. By simply getting acquainted with it they begin now to hate what they had formerly been and to profess what they had formerly hated and their numbers are as great as are laid to our charge. The outcry is that the state is filled with Christians, that they are in the fields, in the citadel, in the Idle. They make lamentation as for some calamity that both sexes, every age and condition, even high rank, are passing over to the profession of the Christian faith. And yet, for all, their minds are not awakened to the thought of some good they have failed to notice in. They must not allow any truer suspicions to cross their minds. They have no desire to make closer trial. Here alone, the curiosity of human nature slumber. They like to be ignorant, though to others the knowledge has been blessed. Anna Carcass reproved the rude venturing to criticize the culture. How much more this judging of those who know, by men who are entirely ignorant, might he have to Because they already dislike, they want to know no more. Thus they prejudge that of which they are ignorant to be such that if they came to know it, it could no longer be the object of their aversion. Since if inquiry finds nothing worthy of dislike, it is certainly proper to cease from an unjust life. While if its bad character comes plainly out, instead of the detestation entertained for it being thus diminished, a strong the reason for perseverance in attestation is obtained, even under the authority of justice itself. But, says one, a thing is not good merely because multitudes go over to it. For how many have the bent of their nature towards whatever is bad? How many go astray into ways of error? It is undoubted, yet a thing that is thoroughly evil. Not even those whom it carries away venture to defend as good. Nature throws a veil, either a fear or shame, over all evil. For instance, you find that criminals are eager to conceal themselves, avoid appearing in public, are in trepidation when they are caught, deny their guilt when they are accused, even when they are put to the rack, they do not easily or always confess. When they are in 
no doubt about their condemnation. They grieve for what they have done. In their self communings they admit their being impelled by sinful disposition, but they lay the blame either on fate or on star. They are unwilling to acknowledge that the thing is theirs, because they own that it is wicked. But what is there like this in the Christian's case? The only shame or regret he feels is at not having been a Christian earlier. If he is pointed out, he glories in it. If he is accused, he offers no defense. Interrogated, he makes voluntary confession. Condemned, he renders sin. What sort of evil thing is this, which wants all the ordinary peculiarities of evil? Fear, shame, subterfuge, penitent, lamenting. What is that a crime in which the criminal rejoices? To be accused of, which is his ardent wish? To be punished for, which is his felicity? You cannot call it madness, you who stand accused of knowing nothing 